Hi brothers and sisters, I have an amazing video to share with you guys. We're going to watch it together. I've, I've edited it some and we're going to watch it together and I'm going to make some comments and stuff. It's absolutely amazing video that I wish that the church would hear this message that Jesus is trying to share with his people. This woman, she died and she saw Jesus and Jesus was screaming. He was wailing. He was weeping. And you got to hear why. This is an absolutely amazing video. I hope that you'll watch the whole thing as we go along. God bless you all. In September 8th of 1990, my husband and I were hit head on by a drunk driver. And my husband was instantly catapulted out of the car and killed. I was impaled on the shift. There were 13 fatal injuries. And I died on the medevac when they were going up over the trees. After they, It took hours for them to cut me out of the car. And after they loaded me on the medevac, I, um, I died and my spirit effortlessly left my body. And I started to pass through the first heaven into the second heaven. And then I was taken up to the third heaven. For anyone who says that that's not possible or, you know, they quote where Paul said, I was taken to the third heaven. I heard inexpressible things that are not lawful to utter. And they say, so anyone who's taken to heaven, that must be a false testimony. Because when Paul was taken up, he said, I couldn't even utter the things. But of course, we see other examples of people being taken to heaven and they absolutely could utter what they saw. Of course, John, he was taken up to heaven and he was in the spirit and he saw all kinds of things. And he spoke about what he saw and heard the things that he was allowed to speak about because God had a message for John to bring back and share with the church. Of course, we always test everything. We test all things, but we don't despise prophecy. We test all things. We hold fast to what is good. And this is good. This message is aligned with the scripture, with the true Jesus of the Bible. And it's so rare to hear. So I believe this is definitely a message from the Lord. And I was with Jesus the whole time. And he... I was in a coma on life support for almost a month, but in heaven there's no time. So it was, he, Jesus Christ of Nazareth kept showing me before the beginning of time till the end. The whole time I was with him, it was his love. No matter what he showed me, his crucifixion was his love. When it came to this aspect of what he was revealing to me, it was Matthew, Matthew 7 where it says broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are those that go through it, which means the majority, many means majority and narrow is the way that leads to life and few are those who find it. So Jesus is the word. So that's what he showed me specifically. He, the whole time. So it manifested and he showed me a picture of what it looks like. So Jesus, when he appears to her and shows her things, he's trying to show her this message that very few are making it, that few are making it. Many are going to destruction and few are making it. In the, right now, in these times, and he was, he was wailing. In the Bible, they used to hire people to wail for warfare. And Jesus was was, was travailing and trying to get, because it was billions and billions of people that were choosing to go to hell. Uh, the pain I felt, it was like me being in hell. To hear him screaming like that, it was just so beyond any pain. I screamed, send me back, I will do anything for you. And so he was showing me the word the whole time I was with him, always. It's always the word because he is the word become flesh. So he was showing me that most of people who think they're Christians aren't following the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Most of people who think they're Christian aren't following the real Jesus. This is what Jesus was telling her. Most of the people who think they're Christian aren't following the real Jesus. This is what I've been trying to, to share for so long. This is what we see in the scripture. The real Jesus is so different than the one that's being given in the shack. It's so different than the one that's being given in chosen show. The real Jesus is so different. And she's saying that Jesus told her most people are not following the real Jesus. That's so that glad that most so glad that she's sharing this information. So glad that the Lord showed her this. So he was showing me that most of people who think they're Christians aren't following the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The leaders, all of them, people that think they're in fivefold ministry aren't really following the real Yeshua HaMashiach, Yadavah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, or being obedient. 
because obedience is the highest form of worship. And he made, it wasn't just at the end. The whole time I was with him, he was telling me this. People don't really follow me. People aren't really knowing me. Imagine how, how horrible that would be for Jesus to know that his church, so many think they're following him and they don't really know him. They're not really following him. And so he's in heaven, weeping and wailing, travailing, so brokenhearted because his church doesn't know him, is not following him. It's a different Jesus. And so many are not saved. And and he showed me that, like it says in Ezekiel 33, where he chooses people to be watchmen. And he says, blow the trumpet. And, and he says, warn them. We are all commanded to warn one another that's love warn one another about the truth about who jesus is but i mean it was very specific that's love and jesus says that's the real jesus he warns it's not just like this lovey wimpy love true love is from jesus cares so he warns he warns us and we are to do that we're commanded and demanded to do that and and then in conjunction to that he also showed me in Ezekiel 34, where it says, Woe to the shepherds. And it, I know it talks about Israel, but we're grafted in, and it's for them and for now. And, and it's spiritual. It's all of us as we're all to be, we were created in Jesus' image, and we're all to be like him, be holy like him. So we're all commanded, whether we're in fivefold ministry or not, we are all commanded to be like Jesus. And he showed me. That's right. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The leaders were not people who, who stand in positions. The majority of them were not really following him. They're false leaders, and that's scriptural. So she's saying the majority of the leaders in the church are not really following Jesus. So the majority of the leaders in the church are not really following Jesus. What is so sad for me is there's all these videos, right, where people say, um, this person is a false leader, this one is a false preacher, this one is a false preacher, and of course we know that those ones are false preachers. They're like the most obvious ones, those that are preaching prosperity gospel, those that are um, are in sin, you know, those kind of things. It's like very obvious, but it's actually not just those few people that people bring up their names over and over that are the real false teachers. It's most, most, Jesus is trying to say it's most of the of the preachers are following a different Jesus. That's what, uh, this is what breaks my heart because I know it's a different gospel and a different Jesus. And if you just go back to the original word of God, you see what the true gospel is. You see about freedom from sin, holiness, the sin, righteousness, and judgment. You see about the wrath of God that we have to live a pure and holy life by God's power changing us. But you don't really hear that in the, in the, in the sermons and in, in the churches. Also, if you just go back to the early church writings and see what the gospel was then, the very first church, those that were discipled by the apostles, you know, we see what, what it really looked like to be a believer then, and it's so radically different than now. So I, I totally, I understand why the Lord is weeping, because we're so far, the church is so far from where we were. We have to go back to our first works. We have to remember how far we've fallen and go back as a church. And if you read Ezekiel 34, he warns about it. He says, I will require the flock at your hand. And he says, you know, you know that they don't bind up the wounds of the weak. They don't seek after the lost. They, they don't help the bruised and the hurt. And it's true. That's what we're dealing with. And he also says, warns against, he says, you let the fat sheep bump the lean sheep and muddy the waters. In other words, people that say they're Christians, they're not helping the people who really, we, we're, we're here to help one another, like in Acts 4, 25 through 27, where everybody sold everything and everybody gave and everybody had more than enough. This is why we're in this situation. Unless we turn from our wicked, humble ourselves, seek his face, that's a biggie, and turn from our wicked ways, we have to turn. That's true repentance. Then he will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. People aren't really doing that. You can't just say, I'm sorry. You have to actually, it has to be works of true love. It has to be the Bible. We have to live it out. When Jesus tells you something, it doesn't matter how profound it is. It's, it's, that's why the disciples could be hung upside down. And, and, and thrown in, in hot oil, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
go in a fiery furnace because his love is all that matters the only reason we're alive and to be obedient to him this is what he impressed and compelled me the whole the whole time i was with him but especially right before he sent me back and now here we are 33 it's september 8th it was of 2022 it was 33 years and we are exactly in what he showed me. He warned me that, again, like it would be, like it says in the Bible, like the days of Noah. And here we are. Here we are. And, and God even said in those times, he will not strive with man forever. What does that mean? You can't just think that G Jesus is like this. That's what I mean. His love is discipline. That's why disciples were disciples. And that means disciplined one. And that means you do what's written in the word. And people don't want to do that. So the last thing he said, tell them I'm coming quickly. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the only one that can help us. The only one. And we, and we need to cry out to him, but we need to be obedient. So that's the highest form of worship. Most people that call themselves Christians are not. That's love. They don't want to hear it. Most people that call themselves Christians are not. And she's talking about how they follow a different Jesus. If the Jesus that you follow doesn't say that he'll cut them in two and appoint them their portion with the hypocrites, if the Jesus that you follow doesn't tell people, depart from me, I never knew you, if the Jesus that you follow doesn't say, fear God who after he's killed your body can throw your soul into hell, if the Jesus you follow doesn't talk about how the worm doesn't die out in hell, it's a horrible, horrible place. If, if the Jesus you follow isn't talking about that stuff, isn't warning people desperately about hell and how to, how to turn away from their sin and truly follow him, Jesus said, who the Son says free is free indeed, freedom from sin. If this is not the Jesus that you follow, you're following a different Jesus. The Jesus of the chosen that doesn't talk about hell, from what I've seen, not at all. Who doesn't really warn you, he's just like buddy, buddy, friend Jesus is a different Jesus. Read the one in the Bible. Get to know the real Jesus. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear what their ears tickle. They want to hear stuff that's not really Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And see, this is all that he showed me and told me. And now here we are living in it. I know you mentioned that there were, there's a lot of people who think they're right with Jesus, but are not. How could one identify that they're not truly right with Jesus? And when they realize that they're truly not right with jesus how do they how would you say is best to get right with jesus mm. well in the word it says you'll know a man by his word so you shouldn't make a vow and not live up to it you can't tell people things and not do it it's huge okay you and you, it's not just words it's your actions you can say all kinds of things if you don't live up to it you're not real you're not a christian because you'll know by their fruit fruit is Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, which encompasses agape love. Yeah, remember Jesus said, if someone doesn't bear fruit, they get cut off and thrown into the fire. Jesus said, we're going to know by the fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. We're going to know by the fruit. So you're going to know by the fruit of your life where you stand with Jesus. Don't be deceived into thinking that when God looks at you, he doesn't see all your sin and immorality and, and all that junk and filth that you watch and how you're a friend of the world and, and how you are dishonest on your taxes. God doesn't look at that. All he sees is the righteousness of Christ on you. So you can continue on in your sin and he can't tell the difference because you're pure and holy because of Jesus' righteousness on top of you. Well, that's... That's not true. When Jesus saves us, he cleans us and makes us pure and holy. We can't earn salvation. That's true. Jesus has to do it. Our own righteousness is like filthy rags before God, right? But it's like getting washed. It's like it, Jesus comes up and he takes our old clothes of uh, that's filled with dirt and slime and mud and puts on us a robe of righteousness. That's true. He makes us pure and clean and righteous. He forgives all of our past sins. But if after getting this new heart, new life, after being born again, we go right back to sin and we go and wallow in the mud and we're like a pig that returns to the mire, the Bible says. The Bible says that we're worse off than in the beginning. Let's read that. It says this in 2 Peter chapter 2. It says this, starting in verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... 
They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So he's saying, if you escape the pollution of the world, so if you're saved, if you escaped all the filth of the world, Jesus washed you. But then again, you're entangled in them and overcome. He says, it's worse for you than in the beginning. So hell is going to be a worse place for you if you go back to your sin. It's a worse place. So so time to repent. And, and the sins we're talking about, the Bible says, if you practice these things, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about uh, fornication, adultery, immorality. We're talking about drunkenness, outbursts of wrath. All these things, the Bible says, if you do these things, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And it lists them out. It tells us what these things are. Those who live and practice a lie. It says that the latter end the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So he's saying a pig that goes back to the mud. That's what it looks like if someone is saved and washed and escaped the pollution of the world and then they go back to them and they're overcome by them. It's worse for them than in the beginning. So, so how many people do you know that are going to church that are actually caught up in sin? They're sleeping around. They're watching pornography. They're lying. Are you one of those people? Because it's worse for you. It would have been better had you never known the way of righteousness, the Bible says, than to have known to turn from the Holy Command delivered to you. It's worse for you. So get right with God. Repent. There's still hope. While you're breathing, there's hope. If you feel that conviction, there's hope. So repent, repent now, but don't be deceived into thinking that you're saved and that Christ's righteousness is like an umbrella that's covering you while you continue on in your sin. We are given the robe of righteousness. We're given righteousness from Jesus Christ. That's true. All of our past sin is washed away. We're cleansed. It's as if we'd never sinned before. That's what happens at salvation. But now we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We have to live a holy life. We have to do this. How do we do it? By our own strength? No, that's impossible. Our own righteousness is as filthy rags. It's only possible because of grace. Grace is what teaches us to live a godly life. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So grace is coming and teaching you to live a godly life. That's what Titus 2 says. It's what enables us or teaches us to live holy because I can't live holy without Jesus. I can't live holy. I can't live pure on my own. I would go straight to hell. I need Jesus' grace every day to, to teach me to live a holy life, to enable me and empower me to have victory over sin every day. And praise God that the Bible says that he will keep us from stumbling and present us faultless on that day. Praise God that he is able to keep us from stumbling, the Bible says. Praise God that through every temptation, he'll provide a way out that we're able to stand it, that we're able to bear it, that we won't go back to deliberate sin. We'll live a pure and holy life. If we abide in the vine, we'll bear the fruit. But if we don't abide, we're not going to bear the fruit. We get cut off, we're withered, and then God throws them into the fire. So let's keep watching. You'll know them by their love, and that means you walk out, we should speak as oracles of God and w live. I mean, we should, everything we do, we, have, we were created in Jesus' image. When Adam, and he, when Adam fell, it, we, got dis we got disjointed from him. That's what the enemy wanted. Jesus came and now he's, he restored us back. So we, back, we have to become back into his image. People think that they're going to go to heaven. They're not really Christians. You, you know them by their love, the agape love, and it's sacrificial. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it feels good. It doesn't mean, it, you know, it's convenient. That's not what it, and it, Jesus, they represent him as this mushy, it's not how he is. He was, he was very strict with the disciples. And with every, I mean, yeah, that is love. It's, you don't, you don't. Let somebody go to hell and say, I love, okay, I love you. All right. That is not Jesus. But everybody wants to make him that way. And he's not. And that's why a lot of leaders, they want to make money and they want to, they want to get popular. They want to be well known, whatever. They just, they're not pursuing the real, pursue the kingdom of righteousness and everything.
Is Jesus full of love? Yes, he is so loving beyond your wildest imagination. But when he went out and preached the gospel, or when any of the disciples went out and preached the gospel, you won't find one time where they went out and preached it like this. God loves you. Jesus loves you. You won't find one time. Does Jesus love him? Of course, Jesus loves him. That's why he died. He gave his life. He showed his love. But when you go out and preach the gospel, you have to first present sin, righteousness, judgment, that God is holy, that we become separated from God because of our own wicked works, that we deserve hell, we deserve wrath, we deserve judgment of God. So we have to repent, put our faith, trust in Jesus, what he did for us on the cross when he died, buried, rose again. We have to surrender our lives to him and make him the king of our life. We're not worthy of him if we don't deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. We can't be his disciple, he said. It's very strict. You have to give him your whole life. You have to count the cost in order to even be a follower of Jesus. That's just step one, in order to be a follower of Jesus. So then you get baptized. So you repent of your sin. You get baptized. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you live life abiding in the vine. The kingdom of righteousness and everything else will be added unto you in Matthew 6, 33. And that means sacrificial. That means lay your life down for God and one another for real. And, and they're not doing that. How do you think the devil has attacked the fivefold ministry? It's not why I think why I know what Jesus showed me because he counterfeits everything. He comes as an angel of light and he imitates Jesus. He imitates everything. So he's going to have a fake fivefold ministry, everything. And it's prevalent just because people are popular or just because people say that they are other people think they are doesn't mean that god really chose them i could say a whole lot more about that because my son and i traveled worldwide we met many leaders okay and just because they say they are or they seem like they're doesn't mean that they truly are we had personal interactions with a lot of mainstream fivefold ministry a lot and were you disappointed when you when you oh my say still disappointed people? we're still disappointed yeah. we're still you know praying and grieving with jesus you know you asked me earlier what do they have to do they have to truly repent and publicly repent and say i was wrong forgive me after they repent first to god they have to repent and repent to the people they hurt. How would one discern that, okay, this ministry that I'm giving to, or this ministry that I follow may not be walking right with God? What are some red flags that you would suggest people watch out for? If, if they're not really preaching the real Jesus, the word, if they don't speak the word of God and teach the real word of God. That's right. If they're not really preaching the true word of God. So, when you hear someone who's been with Jesus, it's convicting. It's not just like, oh, that was a cool testimony. Oh, they were taken up to heaven. They had this experience. And wow, that's cool. No, there's like something in it. See, Jesus' words are spirit and their life. They give life. So when it's the Holy Spirit speaking through someone who knows God, who's filled with his spirit and his love, you feel inside this, this deep hunger to draw closer to God. They don't even have to talk about sin, righteousness, and judgment. They can just talk about God's love, His mercy, but you feel something inside. You feel like, wow, I need to know this God. I need to live fully for Him. I need to, to um, put away all these distractions and seek Him with all my heart. You feel like this stirring in your heart, this conviction, this drawing of God because His words are spirit and life. So if you don't feel that, with the preachers that you're listening to, if, if they don't exhort you to living pure and holy and radically, running after God with everything in you, fasting, praying, reading His Word, studying His Word, living pure, not watching the things of the world, if your preacher or teacher is not, not exhorting you in those things that God really cares about, then do they have the heart of God? Something's wrong because those are the things God cares about. He cares about us living pure and holy lives because he sees hell every day he's watching all these people that call themselves christians fly into hell just fall straight into hell screaming shocked horrified he's watching it happen so if he gets a chance to speak to his people what do you think he wants to speak he wants to speak come after me run to me 
if people are in sin, that's why he wants to speak to them. Because he doesn't want to let people that are in sin continue on in sin. And you can see this in, in Revelation where Jesus came and spoke to the different churches. He spoke, hey, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You think that you're good. You think that you're rich, but actually you're poor, blind, and naked. And I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, right? That's the words that Jesus has for a lukewarm church. Of course, if people are living pure and holy, if people are already uh, repentant and all that, then his message is different. His message is, you know, uh, is less pointed and less because they're already walking holy. They already walk in the fear of God. But how many in the church are walking in the fear of God when these preachers, pastors, prophets are speaking to a crowd where you know most of the people are not walking in the fear of God. Most of the people are watching pornography. They're in sin. They're in immorality. And yet the word that the prophet seems to speak is like, doesn't call them to righteousness. It doesn't call people to live a pure and holy life. It doesn't draw them to God. Then there's something wrong. Because when Jesus had a chance, when Jesus had a chance to speak to people, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the real Jesus, if they're not, Really preaching the real Jesus. And that doesn't mean that every single uh, sermon that uh, someone has to give has to be, you know, on fire and brimstone. doesn't mean that at all. But it means there has to be something in the messages that says, draw closer to Jesus. There's, Do you know that we're in the end times? There's urgency. This is an urgent, urgent time. There's people going to hell. There's urgency. It's not this lukewarm, apathetic junk that you hear so often. It's the fire of God that's shut up in your bones and, and someone who has that fire can't help but to share it. So listen to those kind of preachers that have the fire of God in them that are drawing you to righteousness and holiness, that are convicting you, that are drawing you to live a life closer to Jesus than ever before, to fast and pray and read his word. That's the kind of preacher that you wanna listen to because that's the kind of preacher that are carrying that's carrying God's heart we're in an urgent, urgent time. We're in an urgent time. People are going to hell. We've got to wake up. The church is in a great falling away. There's so many people that are asleep and slipping into hell. We have to be urgent. We have to seek God with everything in us. We have to live pure and holy. This is Jesus' heart. Jesus, the word. And we have to love one another. If they don't speak the word of God, and teach the real word of God and the real Jesus. Read the Bible. Jesus is not, he, he's, he's, yes, he's love and love is telling the truth. So if you, just because somebody does good deeds and they can do a lot of good deeds, the enemy does that too, doesn't mean that they are, tr that their personal life, that they are, or that they're truly following the word. People have to ask God, ask for wisdom. He says he gives it liberally and he doesn't hold he doesn't hold back. It's a matter of pursuing the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth and truly not being afraid to speak up. Jesus is not codependent. It's like, well, I don't want to hurt somebody. That's not Jesus. You're That's right. If you read the word, take your Bible and go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and take a highlighter and highlight every time that Jesus talks about sin, righteousness, judgment, and hell, and he talks these strong, severe words. If you're somebody who leans too far unto a Jesus that's all lovey-dovey, then do this. Take your highlighter and highlight all those things that show who Jesus really is, things that aren't taught in the churches, so that you can get a balanced view of God. If you're someone who only knows God as hell, fire, and brimstone, then go through and take maybe a blue highlighter and highlight everywhere where Jesus shows his love and his tenderness and his mercy and his goodness so that you can learn to have a balanced view of who Jesus is. And of course, as you spend time with him, seeking his face, you'll start to know him more as well. But the word of God is going to tell you so much about who Jesus is. Old Testament is going to tell you so much about God's righteousness and holiness. It's going to tell you so much about his love, his protection of the widows and the orphans. Um, you just have to read the Bible. If you want to learn to discern, you have to read the Bible. And you have to spend time with God every day in prayer to learn to hear his voice. Then you can recognize. You'll be able to recognize and go, oh, wait a second. That's not the Jesus that I'm reading about in the Bible. That's a different Jesus. That show is giving me a whole different Jesus. Oh, that movie is giving me a whole different Jesus. Oh, that sermon is giving me a whole different Jesus. You'll be able to discern. But if you don't know the Bible, how can you discern? 
you got to read your Bible and you got to spend time with Jesus. You're hurting them by not telling the truth. So we're required to speak as oracles of God. That means you confront one another in love. And love is like everything that Jesus did in the Bible, everything, including when he made a whip and threw the money changers out. That's the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I was subjected to a lot of immorality with major, major people in ministry, sexual immorality. So it's, it wasn't just the world. It was in the ministry. Exposing no, themselves. If you, to, if you were to name, please don't name anybody, but if you I were won't. to name somebody where I know who that person was. Yes. Or anybody yes. watching, they would probably know. Yes. Mm. Yes. You know, and, and God is we're getting to the point where God's going to start revealing it. You can't just say he's Lord and then do your own thing. That's not really born again. We need the fear of the Lord to go global in all, everywhere. Earlier you mentioned to me also mm -hmm. that there is a high volume of false testimonies going around. Oh my gosh. Did the Lord show you that? Yes. The enemy always counterfeits Jesus. And we overcome him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we love not our lives to the death. There's fake all over the place. That's so important. There's so many false testimonies. Brothers and sisters, there's so many false testimonies out there. That's something Jesus showed her. So when Jesus was with her, Jesus showed her. There's so many false testimonies. I believe on both sides, there's false testimonies. Um, there's false testimonies saying that if you wear any, uh, you know, if you even like straighten your hair, that you're gonna go to hell. Or if you even wear a wedding ring, you're gonna go to hell. That's a false testimony. That's not in the Bible. That just gets people in fear and terror and they don't know how to walk in faith and they don't trust their what the word says. Jesus said, it's the things that come out of your heart that defile a man. Those are the things that defile someone is the things that come out of your heart. They have this extreme view of God that God just wants to fling them into hell every moment. And there are hell testimonies that are false. I absolutely know that there are hell testimonies that are false. Well, I've heard of testimonies where people say, Jesus appeared to me and said this. And I'm like, I know he didn't say that. I know he didn't say that. I know it's not true. But they actually saw Jesus appear to them. It's not the real Jesus, not the real Jesus, but a Jesus appears to them. And because people aren't testing the spirit, see, the Bible says you have to test the spirit. So you ask the Bible says to ask, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ came in the flesh is of God. But a lot of prophets don't test the spirits. They think that the only ones that can appear to them are true. And so because of that, there's so much false testimony going around. I've heard of the Jesus appearing to people and telling them completely false doctrines. It's, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous game out there to just believe these testimonies that people have where they say Jesus appeared to them. The question is, what did Jesus say? Does it align with the scripture? I believe absolutely Jesus appeared to this woman, this woman in the video that we're listening to. Why? Because her words align with this scripture. And I know the voice of the Lord from spending time with him and reading his word. I know this is really a real one from God, but there's so many out there that are false. Fake all over the place. If you're not hot in the Lord and sold out to, to be obedient and do whatever it takes, you're not part of them. And you're not going to heaven. Not, it's not, it's, it's not, it isn't written. It's not the word of God. It's not the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And woe, woe to the shepherds. That's, it's written in the word. Woe to the, they're not real shepherds. And they're not real churches if they're not preaching the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And acting it out means you have to be made back in his image. Because yeah. this is why I got sent back. I said, send me back. I will do anything for you. This is that. Mm -hmm. This is that in the Bible also means revival, awakening, transformation. The great move of God before Jesus come back and takes us up to heaven as his army. Whether you believe it or not, everything else he showed me came true. This, this is that. A lot of people are not willing to really lay their life down for Jesus and put him first over mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, husband, wife, everyone and everything. And that's what it requires. And that's the issue. Absolutely. He says this in Matthew 10, verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his 
cross and follow after me is not worthy of me, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That's the cost of following Jesus. If we don't take up our cross, if we don't follow after him, really, we're not worthy of him. We won't make it to heaven. We won't go there. And I know it's hard, but the only way to restore family and everything is by putting him first. He, that, that's another thing he said, told me, tell them, return to your first love, return to your first love. I am coming quickly. Jesus was screaming. He showed me that in Matthew seven, the majority going to hell, billions and billions, not one turned around when he was screaming, not one. I mean, it was the worst hell I've ever experienced. He who habitually sins is of his father, the devil. It is written. None of us can make excuses for that. She just quoted a verse in 1 John 3. Uh, he who is born of God does not sin. Who who sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. That's what the Bible says. And she says, he who habitually sins. The word says, he who sins is of the devil. He who sins is of the devil. And it's talking about deliberate sin. If you're someone who's continuing on in sin, the Bible says that you are of the devil. Because if we're truly born of God, the Bible tells us that we'll live a pure and holy life. Read 1 John 3. There's no way to get around that one. Majority. And it's not by our power that we'll live a holy life. It's by God's power. Praise God. His power, because if we abide in the vine, we bear the fruit. He bears it through us. We just have to abide. None of us can make excuses for that. The majority of people who say they're Christians aren't. The majority of people who say they're Christians aren't. The majority of people who say they're Christians aren't. Test yourself, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith, to see if you've been disqualified. If you have, if you are in sin, now is the time to repent. Cry out to God. Cry out to God before it's too late. He will save you. He is mighty to save and he loves you. And he'll free you from sin and make you a new creation full of love, joy, peace, and holiness. God bless you all.